Perhaps I should start at the beginning. I perhaps have people here today who have not even personally believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Human life was imputed to you at the moment of birth. That human life was imputed to your human soul. You will have human life in your soul forever. That human life is going to either spend eternity in heaven, in a resurrection body, or in the lake of fire under the most extensive pain the human body could ever suffer. And the decision is based upon what you do with regard to the person of Christ. Adam's original sin, the first sin, the sin that put us behind the eight ball, as it were, the sin of negative volition, not a moral sin or an immoral sin, but a moral sin. Adam was guilty of instant moral degeneracy. He made a decision of disobedience. He made it from arrogance. And Adam's original sin is imputed to us at birth. It's imputed to the genetically formed old sin nature. So that while we are physically alive, we are simultaneously spiritually dead. Our personal sins were never imputed to us for judgment. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be here. When it says the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23, it is referring to Adam's original sin. And it is referring to the fact that you were born physically alive, but spiritually dead to God. Therefore, you, enter, you learn to interact with people. You grow up and you find that other people exist. And your whole lifetime is based in relationship with people, relationship with things, relationship to the visible things of life. But you do not see the invisible things of life, which are so clearly delineated in the Word of God. And you receive a lot of erroneous ideas. You have a guilt complex because of your sins. You somehow think that you can make up for your sins by doing something, by changing your behavior pattern, by reforming, by going to church, by uh, giving some money to some needy person or to a church. You have all of these ideas as to how you're going to make it up. Billions and billions of years ago in eternity past, the omniscience of God the Father programmed one prom chip. Prom chips are free will of man chips. All sin comes from the free will of man, starting with Adam's original sin. It was his decision, pure and simple. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was violating the divine mandate. He was not only a moral person, he was a perfect person. And yet he committed the most awful category of sins because it is motivated by his arrogance. And that sin is imputed to each one of us. Our sins were in that prom chip until in the fullness of time our Lord Jesus Christ came in the flesh. As eternal God, he cannot die on the cross for sins. As eternal God, he cannot pay the wages of sin which is spiritual death. So he became the God-man, undiminished deity, and true humanity in one person forever. Now, as undiminished deity and true humanity, he lived in the prototype divine dinosphere doctrine of impeccability. He went to the cross. There, God the Father called for the printout of all the sins of the world. They were imputed to Christ and God the Father judged our sins. That was his spiritual death. He was still alive when he had received the judgment of our sins. He even said, Tetelestai, it has been finished in the past with the result that it stands finished forever. Salvation was completed before his physical death. And therefore, when the scripture says, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is talking about his judgment on the cross. 
1 Peter 2.24 says, He carried our sins in his own body on the cross. That is judgment. That is spiritual death. And spiritual death was manifest by the cry, the scream of our Lord, My God, my God, why has that, have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani is the way he put it. In other words, he was made sin for us who knew no sin. He was judged for our sins. He was taking our place. He is the only substitute. He is the only way of salvation. Jesus says, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And so he was judged for our sins. And therefore, after that, he died physically. And then his body went into the grave. His soul went to Hades, the compartment called uh, Paradise. And his spirit went into the presence of the Father. Then he was resurrected, ascended, and ascended. And then, ten days after his ascension and the receiving of his third royal warrant, the dispensation of the royal family of God began. And in that dispensation, we have a reversal, a change, a unique system of planning as far as God is concerned that has never before existed. But for some of you this morning who somehow have managed to get in here totally ignorant of everything I said up to this moment, perhaps what you need to do is to face the issue of eternal life. There is only one way to eternal life, and that is through personal faith in Jesus Christ. The Greek word is pistuo. The Hebrew word is Amen and batak. The English word is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In all of these words, the, the subject has no merit. The subject is spiritual death. The subject is mankind. The merit resides in the object, the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The moment you believe in Christ in this dispensation only, God does 40 things for you. We are studying right now some of those 40 things that he does for you. Billions and billions of years ago in eternity past, he provided for you a portfolio of invisible assets. In time, he provides for you a protocol plan, a plan for royal family of God, for this is the dispensation of the body of Christ, the royal family. And therefore, it becomes necessary to utilize technical language to explain God's plan. God is perfect. His plan is perfect. It is a perfect plan designed for imperfect persons. And therefore, in verse 4, we see the second of our assets. The first asset ever given to us, verse 3, our escrow blessings. This is number one primary asset. The second assets given to us are from the ROM chip programmed by the sovereignty of God and expressing the sovereignty of God in the printout of election and predestination. First we have election and then we have predestination. Note the translation, verse 4, since he himself, God the Father, has elected us in him. There are three elections in history. Israel under the ritual plan of God, our Lord Jesus Christ under the salvation plan of God, and the church under the protocol plan of God. He has elected us in him before the foundation of the world. What is election? We have studied it in detail and we have simplified some aspects. Election is the expression of the sovereignty of God about you in eternity past. Under election, there is equal privilege and equal opportunity. 
equal privilege, your very own royal priesthood, the privacy of your priesthood, the basis for perception of doctrine, growing in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is equal opportunity? Equal opportunity is logistical grace support and blessing. The justice of God, one half of divine integrity or holiness, sends to the indwelling righteousness of God, the other half of divine integrity or holiness, all of the blessings, all of the support, everything we need to sustain us and to give us equal opportunity to execute the protocol plan of God. God never blesses us on the basis of anything we do or can do. God blesses us on the basis of the fact that at the moment of salvation, one of the 40 things he did for us was to impute his righteousness to us. This is the basis of justification. And that was true in the Old Testament. That's true in any dispensation. All dispensation, salvation, the same faith in Christ as he is revealed in that dispensation. And always God's righteousness is imputed. But another thing is added for the church age only. That indwelling righteousness becomes the basis for all blessing. The justice of God sends everything we need in any day to keep us alive and to give us the opportunity of hearing the word of God and of growing up and of executing the protocol plan. He provides everything. He provides a right pastor. No one person is everyone's right pastor. But your right pastor, whomever he is, must be faithful in the teaching of Bible doctrine and preferably from the original languages. And in addition to that, you are given a local assembly, some place where you can hear the teaching of the Word, somewhere that you are challenged in your volition to actually expose yourself to doctrinal teaching. That's all provided. Whatever it takes to keep you alive, whatever it takes to provide everything for you to hear and be exposed to the Word. But in addition to that, there are fantastic blessings. And these blessings are given to both winners and losers in the Christian life. We just happen to live in a day when the fundies are losers because of ignorance of Bible doctrine. We live in a day when people are not executing God's plan, but they are fulfilling their own plan, and they are living their lives as unto men rather than as unto the Lord. And so both winners and losers are blessed under logistical grace. This explains one of the reasons why the wicked prosper. The other has to do with blessing by association. Now, that's election.